Welcome back to Block TV. Now with the Corona lockdown, it's tough to go anywhere in the world right now. But the closest we can do is travel the crypto globe with Ethan Pierce, director of the Crypto Assets Institute. Ethan, thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure. Glad you're, seeing, glad you're all doing well. All right, so Ethan, first up, we got some, uh, some potentially big news. Open Finance, uh, threatening to delist the uh, security tokens? Yeah, so, um, I mean, if, you, if you've been paying attention to what's going on in tokenized securities, digital securities in that space, then obviously you've heard of Open Finance. It's one of the major players on the, um, to build out the secondary market uh, side of all of this. And according to Coindesk, uh, <clears throat> they sent a letter to their users this uh, past week notifying them that it may have to delist uh, those tokens and suspend trading next month unless they have more revenue come in from the issuers because uh, they're not covering costs. So uh, I think uh, th this is part of the, the, the larger conversation that's been going on uh, with this space. But the um, you know, kind of the issue around this is that uh, tokenized securities first need to get issued. <laughs> first, we need regulatory compliance. Then we need lots of issuance. And a lot of people are working on that. And a lot of really great news has come out. And a lot of movement is in that space. But building a business model on the secondary uh, market piece of this, uh, unfortunately, is taking time to get into place. Uh, it hasn't scaled as fast as as they would like. And uh, according to them, if, if they don't you know, get new fees coming in, they're not going to be able to continue trading uh, the, the tokenized securities on their platform. Non-tokenized securities will continue trading according to the email. Um, it's not clear exactly what kind of traditional instruments open finance lists, but um, the, they've said that we, we've asked the issuers currently listed on the platform to renew their listing agreements and cover a portion of our costs, including um, annual listing fees, uh, which is common in large public markets where issuers pay exchanges for listing services. The uh, yeah, but, uh, open finance is yeah. list water. Yeah. Ethan, but, but in, in, this, in, in, this, in this scenario, <laughs> in this scenario, right, the uh, you know, security tokens, the open finance is, is particularly calling out security tokens for this. Do, is there more overhead for listing security tokens or is this a, a kind of a cash grab where, you know, open finance, is str everyone's struggling financially because of Corona and they're trying to say, hey, maybe we can make some money, more income by, by, by you know, charging the security tokens for listing. So, you know, um, the open finance lists what are called alternative assets uh, in the private security space. So, you know, and, and some of those that we've seen are, are like blockchain capital, Spice, um, Lottery.com, LDCC, uh, things like that. And the um, the issue in 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 that is there. While there is amazing stuff going on, we 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 have a couple stories a week that we can talk about. Really cool things being tokenized around the world in real estate or uh, patents, music, film, uh, IP, things like that. The reality is is that that is uh, while those projects are scaling in issuance there is not necessarily yet uh, an enormous demand for secondary market trading. And so I think the issue isn't necessarily that these are expensive. It's just that there's not movement uh, on the secondary side, which is where they're, they're, they're expecting to make um, their revenue. And so I think that that's the problem. I don't think this is a bad sign for security tokens. I think this is a sign of, you know, things have to happen in order. You, know, you need regulatory compliance and then you need issuance. And then you need that creates the opportunity to have the, the liquidity of secondary trading. And I just don't think we have enough assets with enough people interested in the trading of it. But I think the value of the flexibility and and the ideas of being able to the ideas that tokenization brings uh, to the efficiency of operating um, a, an asset in terms of the finances of it make a lot of sense. But but the trading of it hasn't really happened yet. Uh, this doesn't necessarily place any risk because, you know, these are because these are tokenized, the issuer and the, and the transfer agents maintain the ownership records. So even if open finance delists them, that doesn't mean they disappear. Um, and interestingly enough, the uh, uh, Securitize uh, just announced a peer-to-peer -peer digital securities trading service called Instant Access this week, which would allow people to send um, uh, someone a link, and that link then would be a one-click uh, way for per somebody to express interest in buying uh, a tokenized security, and then they have to go through the, the, the you know, if they have the KYC um, uh, and things like that in place, then they can buy it that way. So I think that, you know, while we're seeing negative stories in a negative story in this space than this way other people are moving tremendously forward um in this space tokensoft polymath t0 tons of cool stuff being announced constantly uh, i just think maybe it, is it too early to build a stable business model solely around secondary trading um i guess we'll have to see yeah i guess time will time will tell now uh switching gears a little bit you know one of the biggest uh you know side effects let's say 
of the coronavirus on economically is really been hitting supply chains. Uh, you know, from one end, you know, you've been waiting for a green screen, green screen for a while, and and you know those those supply chains is taking a while to get to you. But on the more extreme end is hospitals which are having trouble sourcing COVID-19 supplies, whether it be ventilators or even down to masks and gowns for protection for their doctors. But as we know, one of the best use cases for the blockchain is the supply chains. Uh, and, and recently hospitals have, have, have come to realize that. What's the latest there? Yeah, so uh, I'm super bullish on tokenized securities, but I'm even more excited right now just about all the cool enterprise blockchain solutions that are out there uh, because we're seeing real adoption and real scale. And this is a story of... Um, you know, a, a need being filled uh, in a very urgent situation, which is the ability to move uh, masks and gowns and, and other protective gear from manufacturing uh, in China, where there is now uh, uh, potentially a higher level of production than the local need in Asia to be able to push that out to Europe and the U.S. And, and so supply chain, um, you know, solutions that can protect that are important because there's been a lot of um, um, non-trustworthy actors and, 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 and issues around uh, payments and the shipping of that, the quality of the goods. So all these things come into place. Last week, uh, IBM announced the Rapid Supplier Connect um, supply chain solution uh, to, to work with this, to fix this. Uh, works with a bunch of hospitals and healthcare providers and other government agencies to source this. Uh, you know, the past couple of years uh, working um, uh, in and through Hong Kong and Singapore, I've been getting contacted constantly to help people connect uh, needs in Europe and the U.S. and elsewhere with uh, trusted people in in Asia to get this these products moving. And what they what they're pointing out to be in this place is that you know there are tons of companies that are not historical manufacturers of this equipment, but that have changed um, what they're producing in order to meet this need. And that, and that's what I'm seeing a ton of is is a lot of this new volume of product is not actually the healthcare supply chain. It's, it's other companies that are trustworthy, that are great manufacturers, but that are new to this space. So they're not in the historical databases uh, with the FDA or, or things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, the Worldwide Supply Chain Federation has onboarded over 200 American suppliers uh, that are manufacturing um, these goods. And a lot of those are new. Uh, so this solution uses the Trust Your Supplier blockchain um, by Chainyard. Uh, which radically kind of reduces the onboarding time for new suppliers and, and, and brings in, it, kind of, it creates a permission system where um, now you can really trust the people on the other side. Uh, that blockchain solution has been used outside of COVID-19 by Vodafone and Heiser Bush, Cisco, a bunch of companies uh, already. So partnering in with that, Rapid Supplier Connect um, creates a more transparent, trustworthy situation to uh, really know where these goods are coming from, know who you're dealing with on the other side. Um, Dun & Bradstreet is, is providing data about the suppliers, including risk scores. Uh, KYC uh, company SiteScan is providing um, KYC information. So it's pretty cool to see what they, they've, been, they've been able to do in this. And I think that should create a lot of um, more trust and transparency. The goods are there. They're, they're out there to be sourced and moved from one place to another. Now we just need to be able to make sure that, that the amount of money that we're talking about, because these are big orders, uh, uh, gets into the right pockets and there's no fraud and that the goods are correct. Uh, um, you know, we're seeing a ton of just really cool stuff in these enterprise spaces. Uh, uh, Dole Food, uh, the world's largest producer of food and vegetables, just revealed the five-year plan to um, uh, take food trust, uh, the IBM food trust solution that they, they joined in 2017, to all of their company by 2025. Um, I think that that's, that's, that's a pretty cool, we're just seeing really great stuff in the supply chain space come in, in, in here. Um, Dole says, you know, the blockchain cuts the average time needed for a food safety investigation from weeks down to seconds. Uh, this is the kind of stuff when people ask me, yeah, but that blockchain thing, it's kind of old, right? Kind of passe, nothing's really going on. It's insane what's happening in, in the enterprise space. Lots of amazing stuff going on with all the Fortune 500 uh, creating efficient, trustworthy systems. Mm -hmm. Now, I think, you know, the, the, the main word you keep on saying there is trust because, you know, as we know right now, like you mentioned, a lot of manufacturers are getting into the game that know, you know, that, that previously haven't worked in the medical space. And even, and, and, and even on the other side, there's been a lot of fraud. You know, the, the FBI has already been prosecuting, uh, you know, people who, who've been promising the government in the hundreds of millions of dollars worth of deals for these medical uh, masks and gowns and turns out to be total fraud. So this is a unique opportunity for the blockchain to really, yeah. uh, to really shine. And, and as you mentioned, uh, it is shining, uh, especially using that for both food and medical supplies. Uh, shifting gears a little bit now, uh, now from, from you know, helping out Corona supply-wise to helping out Corona uh, money-wise, Blocked at One launched a virtual hackathon? Yes. Um, 
So, you know, I, we discussed a couple of, a few weeks ago, the consensus uh, health stop COVID-19 hackathon, which is ongoing uh, through May 11th. So uh, Block One has announced that they uh, are launching their Coding for Change virtual hackathon, uh, which is calling for blockchain solutions in the uh, for the post-pandemic world. It starts on May 1st and goes through my birthday, June 1st. Uh, and so you know, I think that that's really great to see these 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 you know, and events and conferences are such a big piece of, of entrepreneurship uh, on more of a global scale in terms of creating connections and creating opportunities and building things out and communicating around them. And since all that's disappeared, uh, it's I think it's really um, been fascinating to see how, how organizations, whether they were running big events or not, have really stepped up ways to get people connected and working on solutions. And so this this is one more uh, great hackathon. Uh, to, to contribute to that. Uh, according to Brendan Bloomer, the, the CEO of Block One, COVID-19 pandemic has uh, abruptly shifted our, our daily routines, but great innovation and change are often born from times of unprecedented hardship. Uh, through Coding for Change, we're excited to work with the community to play a part in leveraging uh, our technology to address and solve for the lasting impacts uh, that coronavirus will have on how we all live, work, and play. Um, I think that that's, you know, it, it, it's this is such a tragic thing, but it, it, one amazing, inspiring story uh, every, everywhere you look just keeps coming up of, of people stepping up and building amazing things and kind of looking for what the world could be like post COVID. And this is one more example of, you know, it. I think a lot of people are going to understand a lot more about the blockchain and crypto after this than before, given, um, you know, we talk about uh, what we just talked about with the supply chain. We talk about things like this around finances. Uh, we have all of the stuff that we're going to see with contact tracing and potentially immunity passports, which will most doubt, undoubtedly be, be driven in some ways by digital ledgers. Um, so I think it's a it's it's a great way to be getting people excited about what this tech, these technologies can do. Uh, so in this case, the winner of the hackathon uh, will receive one hundred thousand uh, U.S. dollars. Again, that runs through June first, and they are inviting designers, innovators, engineers, entrepreneurs, experts, anyone who has an idea and wants to make a difference to be a part of that. Uh, you can get more info and sign up at the hackathon.eos.eo website. Mm -hmm. Now, especially when it comes to the blockchain, because of its decentralized nature, it only essentially works if there's a strong community. Uh, and, and here we're seeing the community step up, a call to the community to step up uh, and help make a difference in the fight against Corona. Uh, a really wonderful effort. You all should check it out. Now, uh, next up, one of the knocks against the blockchain is that sometimes the UI, the UX is not so easy to use, not so easy to understand this whole thing. But my Ether wallet is trying to change that. What's the details here? Yeah, so, you know, um, uh, well, the, the really cool thing, we talked a couple weeks ago about um, uh, stoppable domains, dot crypto domains being included in, uh, being integrated natively into the Opera browser, which is about like 360 million users worldwide. Uh, they also released an extension uh, for Google Chrome based browsers, which is everybody else, uh, pretty much. So dot crypto domains can can now work pretty much everywhere. Uh, the idea behind that is kind of similar to the dot uh, ETH uh, domain names where you can have a, a human address uh, that uh, goes to um, an actual just straight to a digital wallet. So you could send money to somebody's domain name instead of having to know um, the, the long, um, not memorizable uh, characters that you need to it in terms of the wallet address. And so uh, what they've done with Unstoppable Domains is, is take that, uh, that idea and taken the whole centralized domain name process and, and decentralized it. Uh, you, you can think of registrars like GoDaddy or Namecheap or, or, or one in one um, And you know, if, if you haven't ever done that, if you know how, how that works, you go to these companies and you pay them a yearly fee in order to have your, you know, whatever domain name you want, .com. Um, and then you can go and find hosting and connect all those pieces together. But the the management of that domain name, um, the ownership is kind of inferred. It, it belongs to you in terms of an I, kind of an intellectual property way, but but it's managed through this centralized entity. And and if depending on what happens, especially in a censorship, censorship way, that could potentially be blocked and taken away if if, if you know the, the government or if you're uh, you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, or even with a lawsuit, different things like that. So the dot crypto domains are a decentralized version of that because the the domain name ownership is managed through the Ethereum blockchain, which makes these you know domains. Um, censorship resistant. I wouldn't know to say if they're censorship proof, but I think uh, they, they, they're going to provide a massive uh, amount of resistance to being able to to get in between the, you know, to basically be able to take over um, a domain name and take it away from somebody or block access to it, at least from that perspective. So I think it's, uh, this is, we're going to see more and more of this, whether it's dot .cryptos or whether other domain name extensions, um, um, which I'm sure will be created that are maybe less crypto-y, but, but use, usable for other uh, topics. 
that uh, are also managed in a decentralized way. But in any case, there's a million active users of my Ether wallet uh, that can now, um, um, they're going to be able to buy dot crypto domains directly from inside the wallet. And as this model moves forward, I think we're going to see a lot more of the wallet providers add this business model into their their, their strategy that the, the, the blockchain based domain names are, are, are going to become uh, the new domain uh, registrar activity. Uh, and that can create when you see the size of some of the companies and the revenue that they create in, in regular domain registration services. This can be very interesting for wallet providers. Mm -hmm, for sure. I mean, this is once again, this is just the, the blockchain and the crypto sphere slowly improving in terms of the usability, the readability uh, uh, of this technology, which is really important if we do want to get to that sweet, sweet mass adoption. Ethan Pierce, thank you so much for taking us around the globe, even Always. in these trying times. Uh, we look forward to having you next time. And for all our viewers at home, if you want more on blockchain, crypto and technology news, make sure to check us out at blockchv.com. Watch us on Amazon Fire TV and Roku.